The wobbly was meant for one purpose, the undermining of civilian morale. To accomplish that purpose it set systematically about the establishment of a reign of terror, and so complete was its success that half the population of a state was in headlong flight within two hours. It was, first, mysterious, secondly, deadly, and within a very few hours it had built up a reputation for invincibility. Judged on the basis of its first 12 hours' work alone, it was the most successful experiment of the war. Its effect on civilian morale was incalculable. Strategic Lessons of the War of 1941-43. U.S. War College. pp. 80-81. Two of the members of Observation Post 14 gaped after the retreating monster. Sergeant Walpole scribbled on the official form. Just as the monstrous thing dipped down out of sight there was a vicious, crashing report from its hinder part. Something shrieked. Sergeant Walpole got up, spitting sand. There was blood on the report form in his hand. He folded it painstakingly. Of the two men who had been with him, one was struggling out of the sand as Sergeant Walpole had had to do. The other was scattered over a good many square yards of sandy beach. Um. They seen us, said Sergeant Walpole, and they got Pete. You'll have to take this report. I'm going after the damn thing. What for? asked the other man blankly. To keep it in sight, said Sergeant Walpole. That's tactics. If somebody springs something you ain't able to fight, run away but keep it in sight and report to the nearest commissioned officer. Remember that. Now get on. There's monocycles in the village. Get there and beat the damn wobbly thing with the news. He saw his followers start off, sprinting. That particular soldier, by the way, was identified by his dog tag some days later. As nearly as could be discovered, he had died of gas. But Sergeant Walpole picked up one of the two rifles, blew sand out of the breech mechanism, and started off after the metal monster. He walked in the eight-foot track of one of its treads. As he went, he continued the cleaning of sand from the rifle in his hands. The rifle was useless against such a monster, of course, but it is quaint to reflect that in that automatic rifle, firing hexinitrate bullets, each equivalent to a six-pounder TNT shell in destructiveness, Sergeant Walpole carried greater firepower than Napoleon ever disposed in battle. The tread of the wobbly made a perfect roadway. Presently Sergeant Walpole looked up to find himself scrutinizing somebody's dining room table, set for lunch. The wobbly had crossed a house in its path without swerving. Walls, chimneys, timbers and planks, all had gone beneath its treads. But they had been pressed so smoothly flat that until Sergeant Walpole looked down at his footing, he would not have known he was walking on the wreckage of a building. It was half an hour before he reached the village. The wobbly had gone from end to end, backed up, and gone over the rest of it again. There was the taint of gas in the air. Sergeant Walpole halted outside the debris. His gas mask had been blown to atoms with observation post 14. They're trying to beat the news old they're coming, he reflected aloud, which is why they smashed up the village. The telephone exchange was there. Tilly's under there somewheres. He fumbled with the rifle, suddenly swearing queerly hate distorted oaths. Tilly had not been the great love of Sergeant Walpole's life. She was merely a country telephone operator, reasonably pretty, and flattered by his uniform. But she was under a mass of splintered wood and crushed brickwork, killed while trying to connect with the tight beam to area headquarters to report the monster rushing upon the village. That monster had destroyed the little settlement. There was nothing left at all but wreckage and the eight-foot tracks of monster treads. Sometimes those tracks crossed each other. Between them wreckage survived to a height of as much as four feet, which was the clearance of the wobbly's body. Something roared low overhead. Sergeant Walpole swore bitterly, looked upward, and waited to die. 
but the small plane was American and old. It was a training plane, useless for frontline work. It dived to earth, the pilot waved impatiently, and Walpole plunged to a place beside him. Instantly thereafter the plane took off. What was it? shouted the pilot, sliding off at panic-stricken speed across the treetops. They heard the bombs go off all the way to Philly. Sent me. What in hell was it? A thin, high, wailing sound coming down as lightning might be imagined to descend. The pilot dived madly and got behind a pine forest before the explosion and the concussion that followed it. Sergeant Walpole saw the pine trees shiver. The sheer explosion wave of that egg, if it hit an old ship like this in midair, would have stripped the fabric from its wings. Set me down, said Sergeant Walpole. They're watching us from aloft. I sent a man on a monocycle to report. But he told luridly of the thing that had come ashore, and of its destructiveness. Now set me down. Gimme a gas mask and clear out. You ain't got a burglar's chance of getting back. The pilot set him down and began ticking away on a code sender even as he landed. Then he climbed swiftly away from the sergeant, headed in a weaving, crazy line to westward. Then things screamed downward and the sergeant clapped hands over his ears once more. The ground quivered underfoot, though the eggs landed a good three quarters of a mile away. The training plane dropped like a plummet. The sharpness of a hexinitrate explosion carries its effect to quite incredible distances. The fabric of its wings split to ribbons. The ship landed somewhere and smoke rose from it. He shouldn't ha gone up so high, said Sergeant Walpole. He struck across country for the treads of the wobbly once more. He saw a schoolhouse. The wobbly had passed within a hundred yards of it. The schoolhouse seemed deserted. Then the sergeant saw the hole in its roof. Then he caught the infinitely faint taint of gas. Mighty anxious, said Sergeant Walpole woodenly, not to let news get ahead of him. Yeah. If it busts on places without warning, it'll have that much easier work. I hope I'm in on the party when we get this damn thing. There was no use in approaching the schoolhouse, though he had a gas mask now. Sergeant Walpole went on.